Welcome back. In our previous sessions, we've been talking about the written Constitution. We're taking a, a kind of a, um, a leisurely stroll, a, a guided tour, if you will, through the written Constitution from start to finish. We started with the preamble. We're now in the middle of our discussion of Article I, and in later lectures, we'll talk about Articles 2, 3, 4, etc. in textual order. We'll work our way through to the end of the written Constitution. And then we'll start uh, strolling through the amendments in textual order, um, which is also chronological order, since the amendments have been, been added in chronological sequence. The guidebook um, for this leisurely tour um, is a textbook that I wrote uh, in 2005. It's called America's Constitution, a Biography. It's not required reading for the course, but um, uh, it is available to you. And if you want more details about the things that we're talking about in these lectures, um, more documentation and elaboration and qualification, citation, all of that, then do feel free to pick up a copy of America's Constitution, a biography. Uh, you can get it at most public libraries. Uh, it's also available at many bookstores online. I think a paperback copy will run you about uh, $15 or so. Uh, and, and that book, written for you all, for a, a general audience, um, tries to, to, as we've been doing in these lectures, walk you through the written Constitution in textual order. Uh, there are 12 chapters of that book, and we've been going through the book, in effect, chapter by chapter. Each chapter has a picture, and I think that picture um, is worth a thousand words. Um, it tells a story. Chapter one opened with um, a picture of the first newspaper printing of the proposed Constitution in September 1787. And I think that picture uh, captures some big themes that... People were paying attention to the proposed Constitution. The, the newspaper published that uh, imme uh, immediately after the Philadelphia Convention went public with its proposal, that newspaper uh, uh, editors understood the significance of the preamble in particular, which appeared in bigger type. And you see the great themes of the Constitution in the preamble, it seems to me. Uh, that's why we spent uh, uh, a whole chapter, really, on, on a single sentence. What are those themes? Democracy, we, the people of the United States. Uh, geography, it's the people of the United States, of a continent, but of a particular um, place. It's not we, the people of, of the world. And indeed, national security is a third and related uh, idea. It's, it's us, it's we, and it's us to some extent against them, against the British or the Spanish, the French, the, the Native Americans. This is about the people of the United States creating a project, um, ordaining and establishing a constitution in a very democratic way. Again, that democratic idea uh, in order, among other things, to promote the common defense. So again, you see this national security idea, and you see it all in this, in this opening sentence. National security, common defense will help us secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. By keeping the old powers of Europe um, at bay, we, will be, we and our descendants uh, will be free. We and our posterity will enjoy the blessings of liberty. And that was the preamble. That was chapter one. And I think you see those themes in that opening picture. Chapter two was about the structure of Congress. It was about the, the opening sections of Article One of the Constitution, the article about the legislature, and it was about the structure of the Congress, of the legislature, its basic size, um, its shape. For example, it has um, two houses. It's got a bicameral symmetric shape. Uh, uh, it, uh, uh, we talked about the apportionment rules in the House um, and, and the way in which the Senate um, was apportioned. The House is based on population. The Senate, each state, regardless of population, gets... Uh, uh, an equal uh, say. Uh, we talked about eligibility rules uh, for members of the House and Senate. Who gets to pick members of the House and the Senate? Uh, the terms um, for which uh, the terms of office uh, that these uh, uh, lawmakers serve. So we talked about the basic structure 
of Congress, and we began that chapter with a picture, a picture that again I think is worth a thousand words, a picture that shows you a big building. It's a big building because it's designed to be the people's branch of government very distinctively, and indeed Article I very early on echoes the preamble in talking about a House of Representatives from the people. When you look at that big building, which is um, to make sure that the legislature is going to be of a sufficient size to be truly representative and democratic of the citizenry, it's a building uh, also needs to be big enough to, to house public galleries, galleries of the people who can watch the people's b business being attended to, so it has to be big enough for that. You see in the building itself the, the bicameralism. It's kind of a symmetric building with the House on one side and the, the Senate on the other. Uh, I think in our conversation about Article I, you saw also some of the, the themes of, of national security, the debate about the size of Congress, for example. Um, uh, it needs to be democratic, but you also want to make sure that the people there actually have some sense of, of the world. They have to be a select group, an elite group of, of, of some sort, um, in order to um, sensibly fashion American foreign policy, um, defense policy, uh, and the like. So you don't want the Senate too big because it's going to need to be composed of people who really do have a special understanding about the world. We talked about how, for example, you want longer terms of office um, uh, for senators than in, in, in states because, again, of the, of the need to develop um, some, some expertise. Uh, geography f fits into that story, too, just looking um, uh, uh, um, at Article I, you, you see, for example, that there are not annual elections for Congress uh, every two years for the House, and that's part, partly because it, it takes a while to get from the um, edges of the continent to the, the center. The, the Union is, is much bigger, of course, than an individual uh, state. There's more travel time that will be required. That was the basic size and structure of Congress of Article I. Now uh, we're segueing into a new chapter talking about the basic powers of, of Congress. Um, and um, we begin uh, with a picture, and we're moving from the outdoor uh, indoors. And here you see Henry Clay. He's a senator. He's addressing the United States Senate um, in the antebellum period. Uh, and, and we see a couple of interesting things in this picture. Uh, we see that there's a public gallery up in the balcony, so the people are watching. The Senate didn't begin, actually, um, uh, as uh, an open body. Um, the House uh, was open to the public from day one. The Senate um, soon uh, followed suit in the mid-1790s uh, and never went back. Um, so the people are watching the people's business being done. Uh, uniquely, I think, among the three branches, the, the Congress is a, a, um, an entity very much open to public v inspection and deliberation. Um, that's less true of the executive branch. A lot of things that executive officials do, they do um, in secret, um, uh, 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 espionage and... and, and, uh, and uh, 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 negotiating treaties, all sorts of stuff that's not in the public um, uh, eye. Um, planning uh, d uh, um, n defense tactics, lots of stuff that happens in the executive branch, thinking about whom they're going to nominate uh, before they n name the person. A lot of things in the executive branch are, are more secret. Uh, the public isn't there watching the president at every moment in the Oval Office. But here, they're watching the senators. Now, the senators also sometimes will be meeting in private in cloak rooms and the like, but, but the people are watching um, when the Senate is engaged in debate, deliberation. Um, and I, this is the age, especially the antebellum era of, of America, of, of famous senatorial oratory, of the great speeches that are, 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 are being um, uh, um, offered and listened to. So Henry Clay is a great orator in this chamber, actually. We see Daniel Webster is there, John C. Calhoun is there. This is a reminder that Congress is a speech spot. It's a, a parley place, a place for political discourse. In England, they call the legislature the parliament, from the French parler, 
to speak. So this is a place where not only people um, vote, they speak, um, and they are listened to um, by the public. Uh, and indeed, in Article I, there's a, it's, it, we can think of it as one of the great powers of Congress. Um, it's not always conceptualized that way, but there is a clause in Article I that affirms the absolute, quote, freedom of speech and debate in the House and the Senate. And the idea here is that whatever Henry Clay or Daniel Webster or John C. Calhoun says today, uh, says then, or today um, Mitch McConnell or Harry Reid, whatever a senator says, whatever a representative says on the floor of the Senate, on the floor of the House, is absolutely sacred free speech. It cannot be punished outside that body. Now, if you misbehave and you say things that are inappropriate, the chamber itself might hold you in contempt or, or might discipline you, but you can't be sued in a court for libel um, by a private person who doesn't like what you said about um, him or his industry on the floor of the House or the Senate. You can't be put in, in prison by uh, judges or the executive branch. Absolute free speech and debate in the House and the Senate as there was absolute free speech and debate in Parliament um, in England. Now, in America, as we're going to see in later lectures, um, not just the, our citizen, uh, not just our representatives, but the citizens themselves have speech and debate, uh, uh, freedom. The First Amendment is the next free speech clause that gets going to be added to the Constitution. And this is going to talk about, again, this idea of freedom of speech, just like freedom of speech and, and, and debate. Um, uh, but the rights of the citizenry are a little different than the rights of lawmakers. Uh, there is an even more absolute freedom of speech and debate uh, in the House and Senate. Uh, no libel law at all. If in the real world a citizen gets up and says something that's intentionally and maliciously false, gets up and just lies um, to someone's detriment, there are libel um, suits that can be brought, civil lawsuits for, for damages that um, can be brought, but there's a more absolute freedom of speech and debate in Congress uh, under the Constitution. Uh, so this is a very special speech spot, and we'll talk more about that freedom of speech idea in later lectures. Now, I want to move from uh, Article 1, Sections 5 and 6 that talk about um, some of the special um, uh, um, uh, immunities and privileges of members of, of Congress to Article 1, Section 8, the powers of Congress. Article 1, the first article, is the longest article. Section 8 is within that the longest section. So now we're going to be talking about the longest section of the first and longest article of the Constitution. So something important here is going on. Now, the important thing is that the powers of Congress are very broad but still enumerated, finite. They are not infinite. Now, the question of how much power the central government should have um, and within the central government how much power the legislature should have, these were really important um, uh, issues in uh, the 1700s uh, and they remain so today. Let me just remind you um, that the British Empire basically breaks up, in a sense, over this question, a question that's called the question of federalism, in part. What should the central government do? What should be left to the individual uh, component units? So in the 1760s and 1770s, the question was, what could Parliament do and what could Parliament not do? Before the 1760s, there had been a kind of a, a working understanding in America that Parliament could regulate imperial affairs, trade um, within the empire, foreign affairs between the empire and uh, the other powers of the world, France and Spain and so on. So Parliament could regulate that, and local governments, the, the colonies, would basically deal with taxation and all, lots of um, in, internal matters. But then beginning with um, uh, uh, the, the, the Stamp Act or the Sugar Act and the Stamp Act and the Townsend Duties and, and the Coercive Acts in the 1760s and 1770s, 
Parliament get, begins to pass all sorts of laws that, that it, are designed to raise revenue from the colonies, um, to regulate internal matters in the colonies, and the col colonists push back. They say, wait a minute, you can't do that. And the British say, well, listen, if we can legislate for anything in the empire, like foreign affairs, um, like imperial trade, we can, if we can regulate anything, we can regulate everything. You can't sort of s draw lines and say, well, the central government can do only some things, and, and other things have to be reserved to the individual colonies. Well, the colonies thought somehow you could try to codify, constitutionalize, if you will, the working arrangement that had existed before the 1760s. The empire, the parliament, will deal with certain central matters, and other things should be reserved to the individual colonies. They, they tried to sort of propose that, uh, a constitutionalization, a codification of that working understanding, and the Brits said, no, um, uh, parliament uh, must be supreme um, in all cases whatsoever, and uh, take it or leave it. And the American Revolutionary said, well, in that case, we decide to leave it. Uh, now, the Articles of Confederation soon emerged. How are these individual colonies going to arrange matters among themselves? Because you're going to need some central coordination for war and foreign affairs and all the rest. Um, but on the other hand, the colonies individually want to retain certain powers. So, so how are you going to constitutionalize federalism uh, after the, uh, independence? And uh, what happens is an Articles of Confederation emerge. And the central government, Congress, are given certain powers, basically of, of, of treaty making and war and peace, directing common defense, and almost everything else is reserved to the states. And there's a, a clause that says everything that the federal government, that the central government um, uh, does, has to be expressly enumerated, listed in the Articles Confederation, and everything else is reserved to the states, each of which retains its freedom and, and sovereignty and, and independence, except for those few things that have been expressly delegated to the central government. Um, and here's now the dilemma. The parliament was too strong, um, and the colonies revolted. The Confederation Congress is too weak to do all the things that need to be done. Um, so now the Constitution is going to come along and try to uh, re rebalance the thing, try to get it just right. And that rebalancing occurs most obviously in Article I, Section 8, listing the powers that Congress has. Um, now, the word express is not going to, uh, expressly isn't going to appear in Article I, Section 8. So Congress is going to have not only the listed powers, um, but also certain implied powers that, f that flow from a fair reading of, of, of the listed powers. So that word express isn't going to be there. It caused problems under the Articles Confederation. So let's look at that list of express powers, Article I, Section 8. Eight, and let's just kind of quickly start to work through it, and then in our next lecture, we'll continue to, to work through um, Article I, Section 8, and the rest of Article I. Here's how it begins. The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. Okay, so right off the bat, Congress is going to be able to tax us up and down and sideways. Taxes, yes, but not just taxes, but duties and imposts and excises. We've just fought recently an anti-tax revolution, and now actually the Constitution is proposing a, a pro-tax regime. What's up with that? What's up with that is this new Congress is representative. Ordinary people are going to be able to vote for it. The American Revolution, the, 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 the rallying cry wasn't no taxation, period, no taxation exclamation point. It was no taxation without representation. Parliament didn't represent ordinary Americans. Colonists didn't get to vote for Parliament, so Parliament couldn't impose taxes on ordinary colonists, revenue measures. That was the idea uh, of the American Revolution. Since, Congre uh, since Parliament doesn't represent us, Parliament shouldn't tax us. But now, this new Congress is going to represent us. 
Um, so it does have legitimacy to impose taxes on us. Remember, in the Articles of Confederation, excuse me, uh, in the Articles of Confederation, the Congress didn't directly represent individuals. Only the states were represented, qua states, as states, so only the states could be taxed. And the problem is they didn't pay. When they were asked for money, they didn't pay up. Now individuals are going to be able to be taxed in, uh, when they import goods through the customs house or in other ways. And if the individual doesn't pay, then the federal government will be able to, to make that individual pay. That, that, that's a uh, fight that the federal government can win. It's legitimate because people are represented. So in some ways, not the absolutist power that Parliament had to impose taxation without representation, and not the inadequate power under the Articles of Confederation, really the, an absence of a power to tax, but actually now a power to tax individuals by a genuinely representative body. And why do we need that? The first sentence of the longest section of the longest article tells us why. We are gonna, Congress is going to need to have power to lay and collect taxes, imposts, du duties, and excises. Why? To pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. Note the echo of the preamble, common defense, general welfare. Here's why you have to pay, because we actually are going to need national security. That's going to require an army. Armies need to be paid. They need to have bullets and, and sh shoes and and supplies, that's going to cost money. So and you, you Americans need to support a constitution, the Federalists argue. You're going to be taxed under this constitution, but you're going to be taxed by a representative body for national security. So in that first sentence of Article I, we see a continuation of some of the great themes of, of the preamble um, of the Constitution as a whole, democracy and national security. In our next lecture, we'll work through the rest of Article I, Section 8, and indeed the rest of Article I, and see these great themes of national security and, and geography and democracy playing out. We'll also talk a little bit more about slavery in Article I. See you then.